While Luther was living incognito in the Wartburg Castle, Karlstadt, his colleague at the University of Wittenberg, implemented another of Luther's Reformation proposals from 1520, namely the marriage for clergy. Karlstadt not only advocated marriage for clergy, he actually led by example. And so, on the day after Christmas in 1521, Karlstadt announced his engagement. The next month, Justice Jonas, another professor at Wittenberg and one of Luther's most intimate friends, followed suit and married in February. Suddenly, married clergy were all the rage for everyone except Luther. While approving these particular clerical marriages and generally upholding the right of clergy to marry, Luther was actually reticent to take the plunge himself. I will never take a wife, he said to his friend Spalatin in November of 1524. Not that I'm insensible to my flesh, he said, but my mind is adverse to wedlock because I daily expect the death of a heretic. And then he met Katie von Bora. Katie von Bora was born in a noble family near Leipzig. Following the customs of the time, the 10-year-old daughter was placed in the Cistercian convent in Nimshin. Katie appears to have accepted her life as a nun until she and several other nuns secretly read Luther's little booklet on monastic vows in 1522, and the nuns embraced Luther's rejection of clerical celibacy, and they decided they were going to abandon the cloistered life. They first connected with family members, but many of the family members were very reticent to assist them to escape, and so they turned to Luther himself. Luther enlisted as a co-conspirator, Leonard Kopp, who smuggled nine nuns out of the Nimshin nunnery in nine herring barrels in April of 1523, and he delivered nine smelly nuns to Luther's doorstep in Wittenberg. And remarkably, Luther turned out to be a great matchmaker. He found husbands for everyone except Katie von Bora. And actually, for her, he found not one but two potential partners. The first was Hieronymus Baumgartner. But Hieronymus got pressure from his family. It was unacceptable from their perspective that he marry a runaway nun. The second prospect, Dr. Kaspar Glotz, Katie said, no, thank you. He's too old for me. And so Katie actually took matters into her own hands and specifically suggested Luther as a prospect. It turns out that Katie's timing was just right. Luther had begun to feel the loneliness of his bachelorhood, and he expressed his willingness to take pity on poor Katie and marry her. The private ceremony took place in June uh, 13th of 1525 and the public celebration on June 27th. It is clear that Luther married primarily as an act of theological defiance, or as Luther says, to spite the Pope. Frankly, he did not marry for love. On the wedding invitation to his close friend, Amsdorf, Luther confessed, I feel neither passionate love nor burning for my spouse. And then a remarkable thing happened. Luther fell in love with his wife. Unlike other reformers, Luther openly, publicly declared his love. He would say things like, I love my Katie. Yes, I love her more dearly than myself. And you could multiply those statements a hundredfold. Luther and Katie enjoyed a feisty, vibrant, and deeply affectionate 21-year marriage that produced six children. Luther's marriage was certainly significant for him personally, and as a theological statement about the viability of married clergy. But perhaps most significantly of all was the fact that Luther's marriage, because it was such a public marriage, became the paradigm for a new Protestant understanding of marriage. Indeed, scholars have argued that Luther inaugurated a cultural paradigm shift in, his very, in the very concept of marriage. You see, for centuries, marriage had been entangled with dowries and social status. Indeed, 
the essential criteria for a good marriage match centered on the amount of dowry, how much money, and the enhanced social status that would come from marrying into a socially prominent family. Luther's marriage changed all of that. He and Katie had no social status. He was a heretic and an outlaw, and she was a runaway nun with no dowry. But Luther's outspoken affection for his wife became the new criteria for what it meant to have a good marriage. Luther's marriage reconfigured the reason for marriage from a consideration of dowry and social status to mutual affection. From that point on, social historians have noted that European culture embraced love as the essential component for a happy marriage. Luther and Katie frankly changed the way the Western world thought about marriage. According to Harvard historian Stephen Osment, no institutional change brought about by the Reformation was more visible, responsive to the late medieval plea for reform, and conducive to new social attitudes than the marriage of Protestant clergy. Nor was there another point in the Protestant program where theology and practice corresponded more closely. Luther's advocacy for married clergy, his own public example, inaugurated a social reformation, every bit as momentous, perhaps even more so than his ecclesiastical reformation. 